The sexiest thing, the sexiest thing that a black man can do today is to lead. Brothers, that's sexy. Um, I speak from experience. Uh, yes, I am black. For those of you who were not entirely sure, that is the beauty of our culture and race. We come in all shapes and sizes and skin tones and hair textures, lots of options out there, brothers and sisters, no need to stray. <laughs> now I can say that because I've been married to the same sister. Come on, come on. I said, sister. All right. Four and five big ones. That's four or five. <laughs> People ask me all the time, Dr. Fraser, what is the secret to, re to staying married to the same sister for 45 years? And it's a one word secret amnesia. <laughs> mm -hmm. 45 years. Nora Jean's gonna do something stupid, I'm gonna do something stupid. We discussed the stupid things that we have done, Bishop. We reach middle ground, we bless it and release it, never to bring it up again. <coughs> and we go about raising our family, loving our children, and serving our people. Yes. Yes. Till death do us part. Yes. That's good. That is the key to success in the black community. A strong black family. A strong black family. And that is a whole another subject of which I will put a pin in because we just don't have time to unpack that one. But it's huge. Now, all that needed to be said today has already been said. I got, uh, I got here at 8 o'clock this morning. I sat patiently and listened to 60, 70 brothers and sisters speak with brilliance, with intelligence, with calm, um, and collaboration. It was just a beautiful thing to see. And they covered everything that you could possibly want to cover. So A, I applaud you for that, Benzel. I, I know you often call yourself Denzel. <laughs> Everybody else knows you. <laughs> but you are the bomb.com. You really are. You are about in four black people. I love you for that. Yeah. You are, in fact, a race man, as I am a race man. That we have committed our time, talent, and treasure to the investment and the upliftment of black people first. I didn't say only, but I said first. Mm -hmm. And I love you for that. So let me say this to you from my heart. If I could not be me, I would want to be you. <laughs> You're a bad brother. I, I appreciate you and, 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 and the people that you coalesced around a powerful vision for the future of black folk in Denver. Now, you are going to have obstacles. One of my favorite quotes is from Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was one of the five great Caesars. And it was Marcus Aurelius who said that the impediment to action advances action. That what stands in the way becomes the way. 
Let me say that differently. Where there is no obstacle, there is no way. When God gives you an assignment, when you're ready, the next thing God does is places an obstacle in front of that assignment. And your job, your assignment, is to get over, around, through, under the obstacle. And when, to, when you prove to God that you can do that, God checks off a box, gives you an attaboy or an girl, and then you get a new assignment. And as soon as he gives you a new assignment, an obstacle Come on. is put in your way. Mm. And your job at that moment in time is to find a way over, around, and through the obstacle. And for 400 years, Africans in America have found a way over, around, and through the obstacle. And when we look back on our lives, we understand that the obstacle for us is the way. We are an awesome and beautiful and powerful people. And we need to act like it. All right. And maybe the best thing that has happened to us, because God works in mysterious ways, maybe the best thing that has happened to black people is Donald Trump. That racist, narcissistic fool <laughs> has demonstrated to us what he thinks of us and what so much of America thinks of us. Now, we have always suspected. We have always complained. We have always saber -rattled. What we now know to be true. America elected Donald Trump. And we now know what so much and so many of America think about us. But we've had that suspicion with, you know, with, we can almost say it ain't nothing new. But now it's been proven, your mom. It's been proven. <laughs> so this is a good thing. This, I think, will motivate us to understand that we are in a state of urgency. We are in a state of emergency, if you will. Interesting article in the Wall Street Journal. I hope you saw it. Interesting. It said that financial illiteracy is an American problem. That's what the Wall Street Journal said. Financial illiteracy is an American problem. It demanded that America, both the public, private, and independent sector, invest billions of dollars in bringing America to financial literacy. That's what the Wall Street Journal said in an editorial. Now we know that when white folks catch a cold, black people catch pneumonia. So if financial illiteracy is an American problem, it is ten times the problem in our community. We understand that. Therefore, it is time for us to put economic development and wealth creation, closing the income and wealth gap between blacks and whites in America. I did not say blacks and Hispanics. I did not say blacks and Asians. I did not say blacks and Arabs. Right. I said blacks and white folk. That's what I said. Because that's where our issue is. It is time for us to close that gap. It is time for us to put economic development on the front burner. Mm -hmm. 
It is time for us to create a mantra and slogan around that idea. And that mantra and slogan, as I have been saying for the last five years, is that economics is the new black power. Economics must now become the new black power. All right. And this cannot be done without the cooperation the investment and the engagement of the most important, the most trusted institution in our culture, and that is the black church. Yes. They must touch it. And so we must devise a system that allows us morally and spiritually to fulfill Proverbs 13, 22, that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That is what the Bible says. Interesting article on the front page of USA Today, Bishop. Thank God it was below the fold, but it was on the front page. And here's in essence what the article said. It said that if nothing changes among African Americans, mm -hmm. no, let me back up. That was another article. This one said that African American baby boomers, African American baby boomers, will be the first generation of Africans in America to raise another generation of Africans in America that will not do better than them. So in the 400 year history of our people in this country, we are the only generation to raise another generation that will be worse off. We need our asses kicked. <laughs> Our ancestors and forefathers must be rolling over in their grave. All right. You can count me out of that statistic. I will not participate, and you must not participate in that statistic. Understand that everything we do, we do for our children, just as everything our parents did, they did for us. We cannot allow this to happen. Yeah. Not on our watch. Yeah. Further investigation, further studies, further statistics tell us. As written in the Institute of Policy Studies, a major report, a 200-page report on the wealth gap between blacks and white folks in America. Check it out on Google, the Institute of Policy Studies, April of 2016. Here is the conclusion of that study, and I quote from the study, if nothing changes among African Americans, it will take them 228 years, if ever, to close the wealth gap between blacks and whites in America, but it will take Hispanics 89 years. It will take us 228 years, if ever. I didn't add if ever. That's in the report. That's almost the amount of time it took us to become free from slavery. But why will it take 89 years for Hispanics and take us 228 years? Well, the answer should be obvious to everyone. What is the most important value in the Hispanic community? Familia. Family. Therefore, they have two working on their economic state, and we have one. Damn. Mm. <laughs> Cover story, Fortune magazine, September of last year. Very interesting story about the wealth gap between blacks and whites in America. Here's the conclusion of that study. By 2053, just 10 years after the country is projected to become majority non-white, black median families will own zero wealth if current trends continue. 20 years later, Latino median families will follow suit. White median families will continue to own six figures, $247,500. Fortune magazine, last year. So the prediction with all of the think tanks in Washington, D.C. <coughs> is if we don't get our act together, we will have no money in a market-based economy and a democratic capitalist society. We will work our way, brothers and sisters, into a second slavery. Now, that's not hype. I'm not exaggerating. 
The shots have been fired. The flares have been fired. So we can either listen and do something or we can continue to party. <laughs> Make Grammy nominated rap songs. Buy our red bottoms. Gucci's and Ferragamo's. And wear all this stuff. Right. Let's just see if white folks are right. Now that brings me to a crossroads that we have to engage in 1965. Daniel Patrick Moynihan at the be at the wish of Lyndon Johnson. President Lyndon Johnson, did a major report and study on the state of the black family. It was called the Moynihan Report. Daniel Patrick Moynihan was a New York liberal Harvard graduate. Did his work, published the report, and basically the report said the following. What he noticed through statistical gathering is that the out-of-wedlock birth rate among black families was five times that of white families in 1963 and four, and ultimately published in five. Out-of-wedlock births were at about 25% then, and in the white community, it was about 5%. We were five times higher. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan basically said in his own you know, northeastern or way. The brothers and sisters, this is what the statistics are. But the federal government cannot legislate your screwing. That's on you. We can't tell you when and who to screw. But here's what's happening as a result of what you're doing. Your rates are five times higher than our rates. And if that trends conti trend continues and you do nothing about it and you ignore it, within 20 to 40 years, your out of wedlock birth rate will get to the 60s and 70% that will infect, affect, and effect the black family structure and ultimately lead you into poverty. Oh, the report was published and we were pissed. <laughs> Racist Patrick Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And we did nothing. And what happened? Exactly what they reported. So, we don't have to listen to the statistics. We can just continue doing what we're doing. That's, that's if you want to do that. I, I have chosen not to do that. Because although the prediction is that by 2053 this will occur to us, if you read the national coverage of the front page story in December of last year in the Boston Globe about black people and their money mm. in Boston, it made national news. It's all on the national news, Bishop. Yeah. Boston, one of the wealthiest cities in America. Mm -hmm. A home of America's most elite education, Harvard, MIT, Boston College, Bryn Mawr, Sarah Lawrence, Boston University. Here was the major headline in the Boston Globe. I read to you the headline. The headline was so egregious, even the headline had to qualify the end result. Here's the headline. This is no typo. The median net worth of black Bostonians really is $8. I said $8. One of the wealthiest cities 
in America. Black Bostonians are worth eight bucks. Now, I thought the prediction in Fortune magazine is that we would be broke by 2053. Well, black Bostonians are about 20 years ahead of time. We don't have to do anything, but I'm recommending that we do something. I'm recommending that we tackle the problem and I really see it, I talked about this earlier, I don't really see it as a problem because I'm an entrepreneurial thinker and have been all my life. I see it as a massive opportunity to provide <coughs> education and training to 46 million black people. That's what I see, massive. It's something that we're capable of doing ourselves. So with that thought in mind, three years ago, I began thinking through what was the system that we needed to put in place to institutionalize financial education in the black community? Where must it first be housed and then expanded and extended to? And there's only one clear answer if you think clearly about this. It must take seed in the historically black church. There are 85,000 black churches in America. 25 million black people go to church every single Sunday. We are the most morally grounded, spiritually rooted people in this country. We are the most church going people in this country. You cannot do anything of significance in black America without touching or it being led. Every major movement in this country, every major good thing that has ever happened to black people in this country was led led by the black church, leadership from the black church, so it's got to start there. Now, there are 1,500 references to money and economics in the Bible. So this is no strange subject, we just need to bring the subject up more frequently. So, we launched this year WINS. WINS. WINS is an acronym. Wealth in the name of our divine son. We know who that is. I created a little piece of poetry under WINS and it says, For the wind, for it is the wind that makes us soar, and it is the winds that bring change. WINS. There will be financially, uh, financial literacy centers, wealth building centers, that's how we're branding them. Now I have a little experience with branding. I spent 13 years in branding and marketing in leadership position with Procter and Gamble. Now anybody know anything about branding and marketing? They are the beasts of branding and marketing. They invented branding. I sat at the feet of the masters for 13 years. I was the guy that was partly responsible for the launch of Pampers, <laughs> <laughs> which disrupted the cloth diaper category 40 years ago. <laughs> So I know a little bit on how to package, design, and do the brand architecture for something as powerful as a brand that needs to bring us to literacy. We are, we introduced it last year at the Power Networking Conference. We said, here's what's coming. <coughs> And we launched it this year at the Power Networking Conference. We recruited, now, I did the prototype. I have a win center in my church for the last 14 months. So I was sort of the test market. We're now doing what they call in the branding world a soft launch. So we've got 15 people around the country. We will be meeting in October for the final Train the Trainer. Each person directing a win center must have some history in the financial services industry and then they must get a CFEI, which is certi a certification in financial education instruction. You see, because you are a stockbroker doesn't mean that you can teach financial education. It is no different than 
basketball. Michael Jordan is the baddest basketball player to have ever played the game, but he would fire himself as a coach of a team that he won because he cannot coach. But Phil Jackson was a mediocre basketball player, and Phil Jackson has 11 rings, and nine of them are for coaching. Because you can play basketball doesn't mean that you can teach basketball. Because you can read doesn't mean that you can teach reading. Because you can do math doesn't mean that you can teach math. You have to be certified. I have two African-centered charter schools, and you cannot teach basic reading in my charter schools without certification in reading. But right. so why would we allow our people to teach our people something they're not certified in teaching? Yeah. And this is especially true for black people because we learn differently. Yeah. Right. We are oral, visual, tactile, kinesthetic, and auditory. We're oral, visual, tactile. The white folks that teach our inner city children can't teach them. Right. Because they do not understand our learning and teaching style. We are an archival, no, I mean, we are an oral people. White folks are archival. They write. They, and they, they, they read. Let me say that differently. They write and they read that this world is still being run by books that were written 500 years ago. Don't you ever forget that. They take out of their brain, put it on paper, and publish it. Now, more of us are writing books than ever before. So we're moving in that direction. We've got to write it down because that's, you, and in order to systemize something, you must be able to articulate it, put it in writing, and then make sure that there's a permanent record of it. That's what books are for. So there's nothing wrong with the oral tradition. It's a beautiful tradition. We see it every Sunday in the black church. That we, we, we are probably the best speakers in the world because we come from an oral tradition. President Barack Obama, I remember when he first got collected, a good white friend who said to me, man, President Obama can really speak Dr. Fraser. I said, yeah, and, he, and he said, no, he's, he's a great speaker, isn't he? I said, you know, I. <laughs> I said, uh, have you ever heard uh, Freddie Haynes? Yes. All right. Have you ever heard of Gardner Taylor? Yes, All right. Ever heard of Howard Thurman? Right. You ever heard Jeremiah Wright? Think, oh yeah, yeah, I heard Jeremiah Wright. Of course they heard Jeremiah Wright. <laughs> so we have an oral tradition. We learn differently. We have to learn. <clears throat> so, so we have to teach our people differently about wealth building and educate them differently around literacy. And we have designed a curriculum, a special culturally specific curriculum using special tools and ideas to educate our people about money, to pull them away from the most important addiction that we have. One of the most important addiction, uh, I say important, I don't really mean that, but one of the worst, let me say that another way, we have a very badass habit. <laughs> Now, I've been black for 73 years, and we have a badass habit. And, 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 and we're, this habit is the worst in us than anybody else in, in America. And you know what that habit is? Our habit or addiction to instant gratification versus delayed gratification. There's lots of socio-psychological reasons for it. I don't want to get into it, right? I can take up too much time telling you why that we need to feel good right now. Because for 350 years, we didn't feel so good, right? For 350 years, we really couldn't party, right? For the last 50 years, maybe we could say, if we want to look at this metaphorically, <laughs> we were just partying, we were just celebrating our fight for freedom. But basically, we are really just to two generations out of oppression. I mean, the Civil Rights Laws were enacted in 1965. The Voting Rights Act in 1967, we're just two generations out of oppression. Right? And the Jews did not get to the promised land after they were freed for how many years? 
right? They misbehaved and had to get their stuff together for 40 years. Well, you know, we, after 350 years of the crap that we went through, maybe we had to just do a little partying, you know, buy, buy a little something, something. You know, look nice for a change, right? But now, you know, it's 40, the 40 years is over. The party is over, brothers and sisters, all right? So we, we now have to do the right thing. So we are opening the Wind Center. It is a system, as you've heard me say yesterday, that uh, ideas are wonderful, but systems are better. We are the most creative people on the planet. Yes. We are. There's nobody more creative than black people. That is a special gift that God has given us. The moral and spiritual grounding gift and the gift of creativity. We invented jazz. Think about it. Jazz is 80% improvisation. Improvisation is creating an idea per second. If John Coltrane was alive and you invited him into this theater to play my favorite things, his classic, he would blow it out of the water. Only 10% of it you would recognize, it would, the melody, that, that's the only 10% you would recognize. The rest of it would be totally improvised. If he went home and you invited him back tomorrow to play the same song, it would sound entirely different. That's how creative, that's the power of our creativity. But we ain't that good at building systems. Probably the best system, Bishop, that we've ever built is the system of the black church. The second best would be our fraternities and sororities. That's a system. So we have to move from just wonderful, creative ideas, you know, being great football, baseball, basketball players, right? We are the talent, but we don't own the system. We don't even own rap. Wow. We don't? We don't know rap. We create the music. You know, we do the singing, dancing, playing football, yeah, but, but we don't own the system. The system is a system to, 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 to produce, to package, to manufacture, and to distribute. Mm -hmm. What is the distribution system for football? The stadiums. Mm -hmm. The media. So, we, that, that's a different kind of thinking. And the, this is the kind of thinking that we must engage our people in the 21st century. Now, all of this will come under what we're going to be introducing, or launching, I should say, because we introduced it this year, Fraser Nation. Now, for 31 years, we have been Fraser Net. It is not an ego trip. There's only one reason we used Fraser. Because the brand has been around for 31 years, and it has trust and loyalty, and a fine reputation, right? So in the branding world, as I learned this from Procter & Gamble, this is called brand extension. There was ivory soap, and then we made ivory liquid. And then we made ivory flakes. And the reputation of ivory soap was gave the halo effect to the extension of that name and brand. This is the same science, brothers and sisters. Except you don't know it, and I do. Now, some of you may know it. So, that's all it is. It's not an ego play. It is leveraging the reputation of your brand. Now, the theme for Fraser Nation is citizens of generational wealth. Citizens of generational wealth. That's wow. the theme. Right. Under Fraser Net for 31 years, we had three words that described who we were and what we offered. At Fraser Net, connect, grow, and prosper. That was our unique selling proposition. That was our value added benefit. As we enabled you to connect with each other, and through connections you would grow, and through growing you would prosper. That's 31 years. We're now morphing into something a little bit different, a little bit better, I think. <coughs> 
And we will have three terms, not three words, that will define and describe Fraser Nation. And those terms will be demonstrated excellence. That's one term. That's the first term. Demonstrated excellence. I did not say excellence. Everybody says excellence. Everybody banties that word. No, 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 no. Not black people. We're taking that to another level. We're talking about demonstrate to us your excellence. I hear your mouth running and your lips moving. <laughs> I know you talk in excellence. <laughs> Prove it. Where must that excellence be? It must be a knowledge of self, a deeper commitment to personal growth and development, constant never-ending improvement, and lifelong learning. All of this will be synthesized under Fraser Nation as demonstrated excellence. Demonstrate to me that you got it going on. When you demonstrate to us that you have it going on, you can become a citizen of our nation. So our nation is not for everybody, just as um, America's not for everybody. All right. At least certainly according to Donald Trump. Don't be trying to get in our nation and bringing your babies up in here. And you ain't about nothing. All right. We may take your babies. Oh, right? And, and, and excommunicate you from our nation. And we'll figure out how to get you your babies back later. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I went off on that. So demonstrated excellence is the first term. The third, uh, the second term is equity and investment. Equity and investment. Forbes magazine comes out with a special edition once a year called the Forbes 400. It's the 400 richest people in the entire world. Do you know how 398 of those 400 richest people in the entire world made their wealth? Private equity. Private equity. There's an exception to that rule, and that's Warren Buffett, who made his money through public equity, right. buying five, ten, fifteen million shares of McDonald's or or or, or uh, uh, Nike. And Warren Buffett understood a long time ago that it's much more important to buy Nike stock than to buy a pair of $200 Nike sneakers. Warren Buffett doesn't wear Nike sneakers, but he knows you buys them. You buy them. Warren Buffett understood it's more important to buy McDonald's stock than to eat a Big Mac. Equity and investment. Equity and investment. That is the second term. If you are about that, we can lead you to equity plays. We have friends who are starting and building businesses and, you know, uh, let me just dimensionalize that for you. Had Mark Zuckerberg been your friend 25 years ago and he was working in his room at Harvard trying to get Facebook started and asked you to loan him five or ten thousand dollars, that'd be worth about 25 million a day. That's private equity. This is before the IPO. You understand what private equity is? It is before the IPO. Right? Then there's public equity. So, equity and investment. And then finally, the third term for Fraser Nation will be entrepreneurial thinking. Entrepreneurial thinking. I did not say entrepreneurship. We must work on the minds of black people. Yes. What is entrepreneurial thinking? Entrepreneurial thinking is taking responsibility, taking ownership, and mitigating the risks to all, all things that you do in life. And that mindset may lead you someday to a business. And we know that there's some Negroes that should not be within a hundred yards of owning a business. <laughs> now, I don't know how long you've been black, but I've been black for 73 years. And we got some Negroes out there doing bidding. <laughs> and there's a difference between a bidding man and a businessman. And what we're trying to do with Fraser Nation is put the bidding people out of bidding. <laughs> Right? 
because they're messing it up for those of us who are trying to do serious business. So, that's the next thing. And then to aggregate the brothers and sisters, the institutions and the organizations that demonstrate excellence on a regular basis and to make them a part of this Fraser Nation, which will be a system. It is a system that will be institutionalized over a long period of time. It will be membership-based and chapter-based, and people heading up each state for the various chapters in that state, guess what they will be called? Governors. We have a nation. When you head up a state in America, what do you call it? A governor. So we will develop nomenclature that connotes dignity, respect, and power, and demonstrated responsibility and demonstrated excellence. That's where we're going. Finally, and I'm going to end on a couple of notes and then take questions uh, and then roll up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> to return sooner rather than later. Right, Benzel? Absolutely. What about three minutes? 30. Okay. Okay, so I want to leave. Now, is it 30 before we... Is that, we got to leave there at 4.15. I just want to get the time right. Yeah, 4.15. Uh, so, huh? 3.45 is our stop with you at the Right, right. What time is it now? It's 3.15. 3.15. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to leave some time for questions, but I just want to leave you with one little tip. I have traveled the globe. I have met some of the most powerful and most important people to have lived. From Malcolm to Martin, Oprah, and Denzel. <laughs> and what I've discovered in observing them and befriending them, they have one very, very simple little secret that they are able to act on that less than successful people are simply not able to do. What is that secret? They have the ability to remove toxic people and bloodsuckers from their life. People who drain you of your time, your energy, and your patience. Now, this is very easy to say. This is very difficult to do. Do you know why? Because most of these people are your family. <laughs> Strangling is not an option. <laughs> this is why I believe that friends are critically important because it's God's way of apologizing for your life. You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your relatives. <laughs> There's an old saying, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it will always be yours. If it doesn't come back, it was never yours to begin with. But there's a big but on that, brothers and sisters. If it sits in your living room, messes up all your stuff, eats all your food, uses your cell phone, takes your money, and doesn't appear to realize that you have set it free, you've either married it or you gave birth to it. <laughs> You must be able to remove toxic people and bloodsuckers from your life. Introduce me to your five closest friends and that will tell me who you are. As they know and as they go, you go. Business is about relationships. Without relationships, you have no business. Without relationships, you have no business being in business. In fact, the business you're really in is in the business of building relationships. So your relationships are everything. 
everything. 15% of your success in life will be determined by your skills. But 85% of your success in life will be determined by your interpersonal and people skills, your ability yes, to cultivate, right. nurture, and develop relationships at work, at home, and in the community. There are three networks you're going to have to work on for your entire life, through every passage of your life. If you're lucky, you'll get eight passages. Each passage is about 10 years. <coughs> Let me explain that to you. <coughs> okay. You're a different person at 10 years old than you were at 1. You're a different person at 20 than you were at 10, let us pray. You're a different person at 30 than you were at 20. You're a different person at 40 than you were at 30, 50 than 40, 60 than 50, 70 than 60, 80 than 70. You're constantly evolving and changing and people are platooning in and out of your life through every passage of your life. And if you don't have the good sense to understand who is with you and who is not, you're going down. You ain't getting where you're supposed to go. Smart people rarely hang around stupid people unless they're related to them. I'm just, telling, I'm just telling you, the less you associate with some people, the more your life will improve. And you better understand that when God wants to get into your life, God will send a person. When the devil wants to get into your life, the devil will send a person. Your task in life is to determine which one is which and who has been sent by whom. Our enemies have been anointed to have us do those things that we would never consider doing. Yeah. It is written in the 23rd Psalm. Read the 23rd Psalm. Thou prepareth a table before me in the presence of thy enemies. Now you have better you better be able to discern that. Now, I don't know who I am talking to here this afternoon, but I am telling you there's somebody in your life that went as soon as you humanly possibly can, you must bless them and release them. Yes. Or it's not going to happen for you. This is huge. I'll put a pin in that. We'll pick up on that in chapter 2. Okay. Benzel. And I hope and pray, by the way, that you help this brother do this work. Let me say that differently. Money is the mother's milk of all intentions. And without money, all you have is a good damn intention. But nothing will happen. You have a great start. This is an important initiative. This is for you and about you. <coughs> Make sure that it has the mother's milk that it needs to take the next steps forward. You cannot have a baby and not give it its milk. So I ask for Benzel that you do everything you can, that you make a commitment to this idea, to your future, and you do it by putting your money where your mouth is. It's worth it. And it cannot be done without it. I love you for the work that you and Keith and your crew and your team and the folks that supported this. This is, this is, we ain't doing this. What in the hell are we doing? So God bless you. I close with a prayer. There's a prayer that we use at the Power Networking Conference every year for 17 years. We call it our Ancestral Recognition Prayer. This is how we close the conference every year. I want you to do me a personal favor and take the hand of the person on the left and the person on the right. We are all connected. You do not have to stand on this particular prayer. 
May we always remember those who have gone before us. May we be inspired by their vision and their valor. May their lives continually remind us that service is more important than success, that people are more important than possessions, that principle is more important than power. May whatever we do be molded and shaped by honesty, excellence, and commitment. May our children and our children's children carry forth with pride the nobility of the histories that are represented here and the various traditions that are represented in this room. To the creator of all of us, by whatever name we may, we, we may refer to that creator, we dedicate our lives to make our world better and more beautiful. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now I want you to repeat after me with enthusiasm and I'm finished. I want you to say success lives in Denver. Say that. Success lives in Denver. Because success lives where I live. Because success lives where I live. We must be willing to share our success. We must be willing to share our success. And to help others succeed. And to help others succeed. Each one. Each one. Must reach one, must reach one and, teach one. and teach one. Can I get an amen? Amen.